since we are all a part of the entrepreneurs organization we are all entrepreneurs so it's a very interesting uh, topic that why should we prepare for our business for sale today rather than tomorrow and uh, i was uh, seeing some exciting worksheets that you have created for us uh, and uh, we are quite excited about the event today the super so it's great to have you and uh, now let me hand over to my forum buddy and our uh, day chair for the day aditya so aditya welcome and uh, you take it forward from here thanks anjeev uh so yeah guys let's get started i am aditya pitti from eo india pune chapter and i'm delighted to introduce our speaker and fellow eoer jessica fialkovich she is the founder and ceo of exit factor and a member of the eo colorado chapter when jessica sold her first business a decade ago she had no idea where to start fortunately she was able to exit successfully and then buy her next business For almost ten years, she has built the fastest growing and most successful business brokerage firm in the U.S. But she realized that business owners like us are not prepared, because although we have experts to teach us how to start a business, how to grow one, very few will teach us how to sell one. So she decided to pull back the curtain and uh, about the business sales process and give buyers and sellers the tools to successfully and profitably complete a transaction. Exit Factor was formed by two of the top experts in the business brokerage industry after they saw many clients leave money on the table. Most business owners are unable to capture the full value of their exit simply because they don't know the techniques and are ill-equipped with the necessary tools. After years of research, talking to thousands of buyers and selling hundreds of millions of dollars in transact and uh, in transactions, Exit Factor was born by husband and wife team of Al and Jessica Fialkovich. I think that this is a very pertinent and important topic for all of us, and will be hugely valuable. Uh, I now hand over to Jessica, you know, to take us through the process. Thank you so much, Aditya. I'm so excited to be here. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on which time zone you are in across the Bridge Chapter. So. When I started my first business, I was 26 years old, living in a small beach town of Naples, Florida, on the southwest coast. I had just worked up to the courage to pursue my entrepreneurial gene that had been really buried by a generation. See, my parents were those types of people that favored, you know, the stable job and career with a large corporate company. They believed that was the safe path to success for their daughter. They wanted me to have good benefits and a really stable retirement savings plan. But I chose to walk away from that life at all times and to their absolute horror 2008 and 2009 financial crisis. For my first business, I did everything that we're taught in Neo we're not supposed to do. I did everything wrong. First, I opened it with my then fiance. He is my husband now. As Aditya mentioned, we've been married for 11 years so we made it. We're the success story. I went into an industry which is the wine industry that I knew absolutely nothing about. It was full of competitors that were much older and much more experienced than I was. I leveraged that meager retirement savings account. I took out every last dollar and cent and sunk it into the business. I took advances on my credit cards, I borrowed more money from friends and family. Like I said, I did everything that we're taught we're not supposed to do when opening a business. I built the entire business literally from scratch. By day I was learning about uh wine and varietals and regions and and by night my husband and I were actually building the racks that held the wine by hand, sanding and staining each an individual piece of plywood myself. I still think I have splinters from that uh endeavor that we did. So the business was quite literally my baby. And given all this, I really wasn't supposed to succeed. I had no experience i had the recession against me i had no funding but call it naivete or my youth or honestly just probably just plain stubbornness my attitude was throw it all at me i can handle it i got it i will succeed no matter what and i think us as entrepreneurs that's what we do really well and you know what we did against all odds our little wine store decanted started to take off We hit a million dollars in revenue within our first full year in business. People started to notice us. 
we opened an e-commerce store for luxury wine sales. And we started working with collectors all over the US, then into Canada, then into Asia and Hong Kong. We became a global company within two years. I started tracking the most expensive bottle of wine that we ever sold on the site. First, it was $90 a bottle. And I thought, okay, that's pretty good. And it was $500 a bottle, blew my mind. And then we sold a bottle for $25,000 for a single bottle of wine. Yes, there is wine expense that expensive in this world. No, I've never tasted it because it's even too expensive for my taste. In just three short years, I had built everything that I knew we were capable of. But then the burnout started to creep in. I was working in multiple time zones across multiple continents, something you guys are not unfamiliar with, with your chapter. I had crazy working hours. There's no time to see my friends anymore. I stopped having the energy to get up in the morning for my workouts. I miss Bruce Springsteen concerts, which for those who know me is a really big deal. But worse than that, and in all honesty, my relationships were what took the biggest toll. I barely spoke to my parents anymore because I was too busy. My sisters hadn't seen me in months. And my brand new husband, who I love so dearly, I barely spoke to. And when we did, it was only to argue about the business. So I knew what needed to happen. I had to sell the business and not just sell the business, but I had to sell it now. Just two months after listing it for sale, the business was sold, gone, out of my life, done. I was so incredibly lucky. I mean, here I was completely unprepared for a sale process and it sold that quickly. I was shocked, surprised, happy, all of those emotions that we identify in forum. I had my time back and more importantly, I had my freedom back to explore my next entrepreneurial venture, or at least that's what I thought. What I didn't know, but would take me years to uncover is the mistakes that I made in the process cost me some of that freedom and that time I was so proud of. Mistakes like being tied to the business after the fact, leaving some money on the table for myself and my family, and paying way more in taxes and advisory fees than I should have. But worst of all, I sold my co company to the wrong buyer and had to watch them destroy its legacy within a matter of months. If only I had prepared in advance. I mean, like I said, I was 26 years old when I started this company. My vision for my life was not to sit behind a wine bar and sell wine for the rest of my life and die at that bar. I, I mean, I knew I was going to sell the company. I just hadn't planned for that day in the future. And unfortunately, my story is not unique. I'm not alone. The majority of business owners never prepare their businesses in advance. And because of that, they make some of the same mistakes that I did or worse yet, they never sell at all. 87% of all businesses in the US never sell. So what happens to them instead? Instead, they throw up that you know dreaded going out of business sign. And really the aftermath of that is suffering. It's suffering not just for them, but for their families, their employees, their employees' families. I mean, think about the economic impact in those local communities just from businesses going out of business and not continuing on with a new owner, all the jobs that created, all the customers they've served. But the good news is that every business owner has the opportunity to plan in advance and increase not just the value of their business, but the likelihood that it will sell. As Aditya said in my intro, in the past 10 years, my business brokerage and exit consulting practice has helped thousands of small business owners prepare their businesses for sale and put hundreds of millions of dollars back into their pockets. And so in the next, 50, in the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to talk about three areas that will impact the value of your business. So it will be sold at, it could be sold for maximum time or maximum value at any time. Or if you decided to just keep it, the worst case scenario is that you're running a better and more efficient and more profitable business. So we're going to go through a few different content sections, but we're going to take breaks and address the case study that I sent to you guys ahead of time. If you didn't have a chance to read it, no big deal. Um, if you didn't have a chance to download it, um, Julia, my executive assistant is going to drop the links in the chat. So we'll have a case study and then we're going to have a worksheet to work on. So let's jump in and let's get started. Give me a minute to share my screen. 
So what we're going to cover today is we're going to cover how to define your exit options, how to get your financial house in order, and how to become the owner of your business. The first thing I really want to talk to you about is why it's so important to be prepared to sell your business now and not wait until tomorrow. The reason we're talking about this today is because, like I mentioned, most business owners favor putting off this decision, this important matter of designing a plan to sell, in favor of other urgent matters that creep up in all of our businesses day to day. Many of our clients never plan to sell their business, actually. So here's the big secret is that the reason you have to have a plan in place is because we don't get to decide usually when we're going to sell our business. For most of our clients, selling is plan B. Plan A was leaving it to their kids, selling it to employees, or not selling at all. But something happened in their personal life that forces that sale. In our firm, we sell over 100 businesses every year, and 95% of those sales, the owners are coming to us in a rush with a deadline to sell their companies in a short period of time. Why the rush? It's not that they're unprepared. It's just, and we know this as entrepreneurs, this is no big secret to us, that as entrepreneurs, we're also real people. So we have real people problems. We have real people life changes. We're not just these entrepreneurial heroes. Almost all of these businesses that sell, sell because they have personal issues and opportunities come up in their life. Things like relocation, retirement dreams, or even illness. Life is unpredictable and uncontrollable. I mean, humans are unpredictable, uncontrollable, right? Um, And the most unpredictable humans I know are entrepreneurs. I know. There's times, and probably some of us sitting here are thinking, I'm never going to sell my business, or I'm not going to sell my business for at least 10 years. And guess what? I believe that. I know some of my clients believe that. But the truth is that we don't get to make that decision. All of us are going to leave our business um, either by walking out the front door by our design, or, you know, we might leave by going feet first. So I get it that you might be sitting here today and thinking, my business is my baby too, and I can't part with it, or I'm not ready to do this yet. But I ask, is planning in advance as a buffer, a well worthwhile time frame, just to have that safety and security that if something does happen, you know, and if you're thinking that your identity is tied into this business. Is it possible that maybe like you can have the same sense of accomplishment doing another business or another role? It's just a little fun to dream about and to think about. So like I mentioned in my opening, 87% of all businesses never sell. And we talked about this. Instead of selling, what happens is they end up going out of business. My father-in-law actually went through this. He didn't know that it was an option really to sell a business. And when my Uh, now husband decided he didn't want to be in the family business. My father-in-law didn't know what to do. So he closed up shop. This is a company that was doing about 20 million in annual revenue us with 60 employees. And they closed up shop just two weeks before Christmas, laying off all of those employees. Think about that impact, that impact to the, not just my family and my husband's family, but all the families that were employed by him, all of his customers that have been with him for 20 years. Overnight, they were in the seafood business. They sold seafood for restaurants. All those restaurants that were impacted by not having product in two weeks. So everyone else in my profession will tell you that you need an exit plan. There's even some companies that will charge you five figures and design this really pretty exit plan that they'll put together in a binder. But I'm here to tell you, you actually do not need an exit plan. You need exit options. Like everything else in life, our plans sometimes do not work out. I'm a big believer in planning, but I'm also a big believer in flexibility and giving yourself options. So here's what I want you to do if you don't do anything after you leave today, is just spend some time and think about the exit options for your company. What's your preferred option? And what would be a backup option B or option C even? So For small businesses, and when I say small, it's basically companies that are doing less than about 20 million in revenue US, there's only a few options for exit of your company. 
And here they are. The first is that you can milk your company for all the cash it's worth and close it when you're done. So you can do a structured and design business closure. And honestly, this is a very viable option for some owners if it's planned well in advance. Your second option is you can sell your business to a third party. And this is where we think about selling our business. This is where a lot of those external sales comes in. So this could be selling to a individual buyer, which we're going to talk about further. Um, it could be selling to a private equity firm. It could be selling to a company larger than yours called a strategic acquisition. Could even be going public and selling to a number of different investors. Your third option is you can transition your business to an internal buyer, a family member, a friend, a business partner. And lastly, there's multiple avenues where you can set up your business to sell to a key or key employees. That's it. The good news is it's not a really long list, right? So picking your options and designing what is your preferred option, A, and what are your backup options, B and C, not a whole lot to pick from. And we're going to use strategies to increase the likelihood that those options come true, that your value of your business and the likelihood that it will sell in those situations happens. And that's what we're going to talk about in section two and three today. So before we jump into our breakout rooms um, and talk about our case study, seems pretty simple, right? Very simple step in planning your exit. And many times when I'm working with our clients and prospects, they tell me that, yeah, this sounds great, but you know what? I don't, I don't really need this now. I'm going to wait. I'll, I'll, I'll tackle this in a year, two years, three years. You know, why not now? So I'll tell you a little story. As I mentioned, I'm a really big Bruce Springsteen fan. Um, hopefully across the world, he's well known enough at this point in his, I think, 70, 70s at this point. So in 2016, Bruce is touring. And when Bruce is touring, I will literally do anything to be at the show. Um, my husband, everything gets put on hold. So I'm at the Denver airport in Colorado and the news on all the monitors scrolling across the bottom of the screen is snowpocalypse in Manhattan. They had shut down Manhattan. So I actually get on a flight and land in New York against all odds. And after this uneventful flight, I drop my bags in my hotel room. I turn back on my email and there it is. Springsteen postpones concert. I was devastated. Now, Immediately following that email is a message from my mom. And she says, they're closing New York, the subways, the restaurants, stores, go get food, go get yourself prepared. My mom still to this day, almost 40 years old, worries about me like I'm a 10 year old child. And I reply, of course I will, mom. I'll totally take care of that. So instead I strolled downstairs to meet my sisters and we decide we're going to explore New York. I mean, we're in New York with the entire city shut down in the middle of a snowstorm. So we make the most of our time. We drink lots of champagne. We laugh. We even make snow angels in Times Square. Day kind of gets by me. So walking back to the hotel, it's dark now. And my mom's text dawns on me that they're shutting down the restaurants and, and everything. I should probably get some food. So I'm looking around as I'm walking back to the hotel and everything's closed. Um, these stores, Dwayne Reed, that are all throughout New York, they're all closed. All the restaurants are closed, even all the 7-Elevens. So we finally find one sketchy convenience store that's open. You know, the kind of stores where you walk in and the lights are flickering and you're not really sure how long the food's been on the shelves. So we walk in and the only thing left in the store is a warm six pack of beer and three bags of Funyuns, which are these really gross fried onion chips. And that's all the food and beverage that I would, I would have with my other two sisters to last us for 24 hours. So why do I tell you the story? Why, how is it relevant to us selling our businesses? The moral of the story is that all times, I think we delay things that we know that are important, but not urgent. We delay preparing instead of doing the things that are sitting on our desk and more important or more fun now. So I don't want you to get stuck with the equivalent of Funyuns and warm beer for exit options in your business. I know there's a lot more urgent projects in your business, but really the biggest impact that you can make in your exit strategy is just prioritizing and defining your options now and not waiting for the equivalent of a blizzard to hit your business and leave you picking the empty shelves. So what we're going to do now is we have a case study of a husband and wife team that we worked with. They owned an advertising agency. 
and we're going to send you all into breakout rooms. So I think Alexandra will do about three or four rooms, right? Yep. So if we do four rooms, there'll be five, six um, participants per room. Is that okay with you? Yeah, that's perfect. And the first thing we're going to just tackle is we're going to kind of familiarize ourselves with a case study. And we're going to just talk about what do we think the options are for their advertising agency called E Street. And what are, and when we come back, we'll share by a group, what's their best exit option? What do you think is their most viable option for the future to sell? Any questions before we get started? All right, Alexandra, send everybody back. We'll see you back all in about five minutes. All right, welcome back everybody. Is everybody back with us at this point? Great, so I'd love before we jump into the next content section, I'd love to get some shares from the room on ideas for exit for this company. Um, what about room one? I think that was the room. Oh, go ahead. Yes. I'll speak, I'll speak about room one and what we kind of, our thought process was pretty simple. Um, I mean, this is not a business, definitely small business. Um, they're not making a lot of money. Um, looking at the key employees, um, we kind of thought, and maybe this was too far thinking, but uh, we were wondering if they would even be able to get the kind of financing they wanted to buy the business out and felt that the best option for them um, would be to milk the cash and close the doors, especially if they're thinking retirement um, and, and just money to, to, to hold on to. Awesome. Great thought process. What about room two? That was, looks like uh, two Nikhil's Varun. That was uh, who was in room two, if you guys didn't know which room you were in. Well, I'll speak for room two then. Uh, so essentially the, the thought process was very similar to room one where uh, uh, it's a smaller business and uh, basically cash in and, and, uh, and move forward. Okay, cash and close the doors. Yep. Room three, did you guys have the same thought, thought process or anything different? Uh, we frankly did not get a chance to be able to discuss it uh, too much, so uh, we would like to comment on something we didn't do or justice to. All right, awesome. We're getting getting to caught up with each other instead, which is totally fine to use breakout rooms. So, what about room four? Different thought process, same. We had a thought process to sell to third party. Okay. Um, and uh, for continuity of culture. And with deeper understanding of the employee, if the employees to offer similar thing to third party, sending to employees could be another option. Yep. Yeah, I think those are all really great options. So I'll I'll kind of comment on this and we'll find out what happened at the, the end of our time together today. But really the, the company does have three options, right? They can close the business and milk the cash. They do have a key employee that is possibly capable of running the so that's an option for them to sell to. And they are a small business, but they are large enough to be acquired by a third party buyer. So that could sell. So those are all three really good viable options. So what I wanna take out of these, uh, this, these times together and when we're thinking about this is thinking about how you would apply the lessons to your own business. And if you guys want, um, at the end of the presentation, I'll throw up my email address I have a more in-depth working worksheet that you can take your business through this exact same process that we're going to go through with the case study today. So that being said, let's tackle our next topic, which is all about finances. So the, the second thing I really want to talk about is getting your financial house in order. And this is the number one thing that affects the saleability of all companies. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. It doesn't matter what country you're in. Financials are the key to success in selling a business. And I don't want to scare you and talk a little bit about numbers, um, but my goal is really with all the entrepreneurs I talk to is to make them comfortable with financial statements, changing the way we think about numbers in our business. I'm sure some of us keep scorecards in our business where we track key performance indicators like revenue, sales prospects, conversion rates, customer satisfaction ratings. Well, how I think about financial statements, that being your 
profit and loss statement, your balance sheet, and your cash flow statement, I think that they're just another scorecard in our business. But this scorecard in our business is what business brokers and investment bankers use to determine the value of our business. It's what business buyers use to determine what they will pay for our business. And it's what business bankers use to determine whether or not your business is valuable enough to receive financing. So this piece is critical. This piece alone, just the financial piece, is responsible for half of all deals dying or never moving forward through the due diligence process. Books and records is also the number one determining factor, whether you receive cash at closing for your business or it creates a need for significant earnouts or seller financing where you're not receiving the funds until well into the future. And I believe that equally as important as selling your business for the maximum value is getting the most cash up front at closing. Cash up front at closing today is more valuable than waiting on a buyer who may never pay on an earnout or a seller note. So when it comes to finances and how finances affect your business valuation, there's about 10 different ways that you can address improving your finances. We can't cover all of those today, but so we're just going to cover three. However, what I do want to kind of emphasize here is that changing the way we think about increasing value of our companies. So most of us will probably think if we're going to increase the value of our business, we need to grow it. We need to grow the top line. We need to grow our revenue. We need to grow our sales. Actually, the company is going to be more valuable if we focus on the other side of our profit and loss statement, the expense side first. So limiting our expenses, reducing our expenses to increase our profit margins first will increase the company's value faster than growing the business in the top line. So here's those three ways. So first, keep your books and uh, books and records updated and review them quarterly. And when I say this, I mean personally review the numbers yourself. So we've had plenty of clients that have entrusted their bookkeepers, controllers, and account managers to have books, to manage their books, and they still have issues in the deal process. And this isn't like, you know, something terrible, like embezzlement or anything like that. It's just because things get missed and no one knows your business better than you. So this is an exercise I do in my own business, and it's even good just for finding profit and putting extra cash in my pockets. Last year, I increased the, value, the profit in our business by 40%, just by going through our expenses once a quarter and asking the question, is this still working? And is it still necessary? So there's times things creep up in our business, just like our personal life, where they're still getting billed to the company and it might not be working. I was actually talking to our marketing team yesterday for my company, and we've been running one of the same um, pay-per-click advertising campaigns for five years. And we haven't readdressed whether or not it's actually effective in determining a good ROI in our business. And what we found in digging into the numbers is that it is still effective and it's actually cheaper than all the other different campaigns we have tried in the last 12 months by a factor of like, I think it's the other campaigns are like three times more expensive. So what we did is we shut off all of those testing campaigns and poured more money into the campaign that's still working five years on. And we're able to generate more revenue from that at a higher profit margin. So I'm sure if you sit down and go through this, you'll find some expenses in your business that you can eliminate. And how businesses are valued, we're not going to get into valuation too much today, but you get paid a multiple of earnings. So if you think about it, every dollar that you drop from the top, from the top line down to the bottom in terms of profit, you're going to get paid a multiple. You know, so sometimes two, four, ten dollars for that one dollar upon your exit. The second thing you can do is you can benchmark your business against your industry. I use a tool called BizMiner. Um, I know they have um, data in North America. I don't know about all around the world, but it's bizminer.com. And there you can go and find an example of an average company in your industry. And you can see on average what those companies spend on each expense line item per year. And we're going to work through an example with our case study as well. We had a company in the salon industry, the hair salon um, industry that did this exercise. And for them, 2020 was a really hard year. Um, in 2020, most of the hair salons in the U.S. were closed due to COVID restrictions. So 
planning for 2021 was going to be pretty difficult because they were still facing some restrictions moving into the future and they were trying to sell. So we pulled this industry comparison report and ran it against their budget for 2021. And we found that on average, they were overspending on their rent, payroll, insurance, and marketing. They took that information and they were able to renegotiate most of those expenses. And the result was instead of projecting a loss for the year, they're now project, they were now projecting the highest profit the company had ever seen, even though their revenue was still going to be down from their 2019 levels. So in business valuation, revenue really is vanity where profit is sanity. And like I mentioned, valuations are complex, but essentially the value, the value of your business is just a multiple of your earnings. So focusing on dropping every dollar you can to the bottom line so you can be paid three, four, 10 times that value in the exit. The third item you can do is remove or limit non-essential and personal expenses in the business. If you have non-essential or personal expenses in the business, it's really best practice to remove them. And there is a method you can do, use to add these back, but it, it makes everything really messy. And in particular, business bankers don't really like those personal expenses being in there. And when I say personal expenses, it could be something personal like a trip, or it could be a non-essential expense. Like maybe you're doing some research and development for another company that you're involved in. Those are expenses you don't want in your operating entity that you're planning on selling in the future. So remember I talked about, we have this category of individual buyers. What these individual buyers are is they're actually not entrepreneurs. So they're people leaving corporate careers and they decide they want to enter entrepreneurship through purchasing a business rather than starting a business. This is a very, very big segment of business buyers. It's actually, when I talk to entrepreneurs, they're completely unaware that this buyer segment exists. I was unaware too. I sold my first two businesses to buyers like this, but it's the largest category of business buyers in all markets. So US, UK, Australia, any, any of those markets, all of these buyers account for about 70 to 80% of the business buyers. So they acquire more businesses than private equity or strategic buyers, anything like that. So these people fleeing from corporate are the most likely buyer for most small to mid-sized businesses. But these business buyers, they really don't understand entrepreneurship yet. So they get scared by numbers and they get scared by messiness in numbers. So we try to avoid these add backs or these adjustments by removing all these business expenses that aren't related to our current companies ahead of time. So often I'm asking the, this question, especially in the US, okay, Jess, what do I do if I want clean books and records, but I don't want to reduce, I don't want to put reduce my expenses because I'll pay more in taxes, right? So there's a game in the US where you, you expense more things. So you pay a reduced amount in taxes on your profit. Is there a better way to do that and prepare the company for sale? And the answer is yes. So I'm not an accountant, but what I recommend a lot of our clients to do is to work with their accountant to set up a separate holding company. And this is a company where you can do some of that research and development. You can investigate other businesses that you want to start, or maybe investigate even different marketing methods for your business. And that's where you keep these non-essential business expenses. They're not expenses that are needed to continue to run the business. So if you have things like um, personal development or coaching programs like EO, not an essential expense for your business for operations. You can put that in that holding company. Um, personal vehicles, cell phones, you know, strategy summits, executive retreats, anything like that. So if you really want to impact the value of the business, you know, the one thing you need to do is just go through this checklist of your financials on a quarterly basis. And it'll keep you on track of keeping your financials clean and also dropping more profit into the business. So even if you decide not to sell, you have a more profitable, profitable company. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look, go back and look at E street and look at their financial areas and look where they could possibly, you know, the first question is going to be how, what do they need to focus on in cleaning up their financials? Like what is the, the first 
thing that they need to do. And then the second question that you're going to discuss is where are some areas that Minda and Ron can reduce or remove expenses to increase their EBITDA or their earnings before interest taxes and depreciation? All right. I think we've got everybody back. So uh, just for time purposes, I'll just ask if there's any rooms that want to share findings that they discovered on um, ways to um, increase the EBITDA or reduce expenses in the business. Um, room one, can we go? Okay. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, so of course we, I mean, again, this is listening to some of the things you said before we went into our rooms, just looking at cutting some of their expenses. Uh, first thing that kind of stood out was advertising. Mm -hmm. um, they seem to be a lot higher um, than industry average. Um, and we also looked at, you know, somewhere in there, there's probably quite a bit of personal expenses. Yep. That yeah, definitely. They could, um, that they could move out of there. Um, and there was something about the bookkeeper because they keep changing bookkeeper. Mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe we felt like that was a, some cost in there that they could um, reduce and, and in essence increase profitability. Yeah, that was a good catch of the bookkeeper too, right? Because not just cost, but consistency for year to year, mm -hmm. right? So if you're changing accountants and bookkeepers year to year, it was mentioned in there that like they had different categories and things were a bit messy. So one thing they could do right away is tackle is just stabilizing their bookkeeping and make sure it's consistent year to year, but good catch on the advertising expenses too. Anything to add rooms two, three, or four? Yeah, I think uh, basically we have covered it uh, all. It's about going through every line item, being on top of your numbers, taking out all uh, the personal expenses. Uh, you know, if they are looking to sell to their employees, they can stop probably stop paying themselves for a year. Uh, that will add drastically to the profit to, to, to the profit line. And then if their employee is going to take over. Uh, you know, it, uh, you know, almost ends up doubling their number. And if it, that adds to the valuation, then why not? So, yep. so, you know, it's, it's about benchmarking and we recently had a session. You can watch the recording of our cash flow planning. So we had Alan Mills talk about that 1% improvement that you can make that can have a big impact. So probably, you know, what, what are the small things they can do to add big value? The right. only the, where we feel there is a risk is that 35% sales are coming from him personally. So how does he, you know, sh uh, you know, institutionalize that? So that's a big challenge that they need to look at. That's perfect timing. And um, I don't want to uh, take away from room four, but we are we're running a little short on time. And that's a perfect segue to our last topic we're going to talk about today. So the last thing that we're going to talk about today is how to get out of the operator seat in your business. And what I'm talking about this is we're moving to that, you know, we're managing the high level of the business and we're not in the day-to-day -day operations of our company. And, and the reason really this is important in a, in a sale is because like Sanjeev just talked about, it increases the risk for a buyer, right? So if an owner is producing most of the sales or they're doing a, a pretty big um, part of the production role or management role, there's a risk to the buyer that those customers might go away because they're doing business with the owner and not the company. So we're trying to remove ourselves out of most of the seats on the bus, as Jim Collins calls it. But there's a strategy to do this in preparation for sale because some of the roles are more valuable than others. So if we're looking at the most valuable role to get out of first, it's revenue gen generating roles. So this is sales or marketing. And whatever role in your business is critical re to revenue is the one that needs to be least reliant on the owner. Because if not, if what happens if you go away, the sales do too. And there is a key indicator here. So most business buyers do not want to see any person, owner or not owner, responsible for 20% or more of the revenue. If they are responsible for 20% or more, that becomes a very big risk factor. And that person is going to be critical to stay on after the sale, whether it's a key employee or the owner. The second role to get out of is customer facing roles. So this could be account management, 
um, customer service, or even related to some production roles. But again, making sure that the customers are doing business with the company, not just the owner. The third role is production. And production could be if, if you produce a physical product or source of physical product, this is what I mean by production. Or if you're in a service-based business where you're delivering consulting services, that could be production too. And this is where you would want to remove or train someone within your staff to handle it. The last uh, types of roles to get out of, and these aren't as critical. So if an owner is able to remove themselves from the first three first, then the business is still going to usually generate an additional multiple of 0.5 to two times more than an owner operator business. If they can get out of the employee management, which is managing your frontline employees, that's going to increase the value even further. And that's what moves the business to what's called a full owner absentee business. So we're not going to jump into the final breakout room because I want to respect everyone's time, but we are going to talk about what happened to E Street. So what happened to E Street, obviously that's not the real name of the company, but um, I wanted to protect our clients. But what they were able to do is they were able to move owner absentee. So if you noticed, both the owners, were they kind of sort of had jobs. They weren't really working um, what I would call a full-time job in the business. They were kind of poking around and jumping in here or there. The one owner was responsible for 35% of the sales, uh, which is a good um, a point to point out, but uh, most of those sales were actually recurring sales. So they were able to move those sales to the account manager who was only at about 60% capacity and then train their new sales rep to take over that last 5% of new sales generation. The wife in the company was, was kind of still um, poking around, but she was really only working about 10 hours a week. So she was easier to replace. They were able to reduce a lot of expenses, um, really starting by tackling their cost of service. So their cost of service, they were paying a bit more than some of their competitors. They were able to bring that down, reduce their advertising expenses, reduce some expenses that were really non-essential and not working um, ahead of the sale. And they had decided that their best method was to sell to a third party and they were able to get 90% cash down. That key employee that was identified really didn't qualify for financing, which I think group one or two had pointed that out. Um, so they were looking at probably a 50% seller financing situation if they would have sold to the third party. So they were able able to get their business, their, the maximum value that they really could have grown the business to is 2.4 million. And that's if they would have removed themselves from everything, reduced every single expense and sold at the highest multiple possible, which would have given them cash down of $2.1 million. Their actual sale, they increased the value from about $400,000 to $1.59, $1.6 million. And a lot of it was that Yes, they moved their expenses down and increased their profitability, but in doing that, making the business more profitable and less reliant on them, they got a higher multiple. So instead of selling for four times EBITDA, they sold for five and a half times EBITDA. So we can see how the power of just preparing a little bit in advance can increase the value of a business significantly. So whether today you're thinking about, I'm ready to sell my business now whether you want to sell in the future, or whether you believe your business will stay in the hands of family or your employees for generations, designing a plan for sale ahead of time really ensures that that can happen. And if you guys want the worksheet we went through today for your business, just send me an email. My email is jessica at exitfactor.com. And I can send you a more in-depth worksheet to walk yourself and your business through this practice. And I recommend just an hour a quarter. Really just doing this an hour a quarter can get you to the goal you need to be at. I want you to picture a day when you know exactly what to do to get your business sold. Picture a day when your EO friends come up to you and say, wow, you really have a solid exit plan. Picture a day when you're finally on that one big trip you've always wanted to take and you never have to check your phone because you know your business is in good hands. Really, you're just an hour per quarter away from planning from that day. So I'll leave you with this. Your business is valuable. You have exit options for your company. Your business is valuable and gets the phone to ring with solicitations to sell. Your business is valuable and will sell for max value no matter what situation you face. I believe your business is valuable. Thank you all so much for your time. 
and I appreciate the interaction in the breakout groups. And I know now we have some time for some questions. Anybody have questions about the exercise? Um, I think we can just, Nikhil, you can just take yourself. You, we have a small enough group. You can just take yourself off mute and ask the question if you'd like to. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks for the yeah. presentation and the, and the lessons today. My question was, um, in your E Street example, you, you talked about them reducing expenses and cleaning up their books and then getting revalued. So if you're going through a buying process and you're trying to convince a seller that this is the price that makes sense, you know, they look at the, the books historically. So wouldn't that mean like if I have to go through the process of cleaning up my books, don't I have to wait for another accounting period to lapse? And then in the next financial statements, that's when we do the valuation. How, how, how does that play out? Like, how did it work out for E Street? And, and how, do you, how do you explain to the buyer that, oh, okay, this is what we did for the new financial statement. And that's why we need to look at this valuation. Don't look back at last year and the previous year. Yeah, so that's why it's important to do ahead of the sale. So in this company, they came to us first before they went on the market and advertised to a buyer. So we we're able to do the cleanup before. So the buyer never saw the original financial statements. So what they did was they cleaned up the financials, restated them. Um, in this case, they actually re refiled some tax returns too. And then we went to market with a clean set of books and records. Um, in, in your example, it's a lot harder to do and a lot harder to explain if the buyer had seen the original set of books, books and records and then restated and things like that, um, that, that would probably limit the valuation and we wouldn't be able to achieve the success if we had already gone to market. It's a great uh, question though. I have a follow-up question. Yep. So, uh, in, in this whole valuation process, I've heard of something called rationalizing the books. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's something about like, okay, here's the books as they are but it's got your living expenses. It's got your house mortgage in there. You don't have a salary for yourself. You're taking dividends. So it's very tax efficient, but it's not a real true valuation of the business. So right. is, is that a thing? I've never gone through it myself. So I don't know if people do this and then they say, okay, here's your books. And then here's your rationalized books. Yes, it is a thing. It's called, I mentioned it, it's called um, adding back expenses or adjusting EBITDA. It's not recommended um, because it's, it causes messiness in the business that investment bankers don't love, buyers don't love, um, you know, loan officers, bankers don't love. And it also, it, it causes, especially if you're dealing with a buyer who's not very savvy in entrepreneurship, it causes them to think that there's more red flags in the business, right? So if this is how the books are treated, like what else is going on that's hidden that I need to uncover? It's, it's like starting that subconscious questioning process. Um, but it is a thing. It's it's called um, adjusted EBITDA, and it happens in in most businesses. And it, what'll happen is it'll limit the multiple that 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 business sells for. Great, thanks, Jessica. You're welcome. Hey, Jessica, thanks for that yep. uh, talk. Um, what are some of the businesses that you're seeing that are uh, kind of getting on the market right now, and uh, what are some of the good buys in your in your opinion? Yeah, it's, in terms it's of sector. Yeah, it's great. It's it's actually really hard right now. It's a very um, big seller's market. So uh, what's going on in the U.S. and and some of my colleagues in other countries are having the same issue. We've had this thing going on called the Great Resignation, where a lot of the millennial and Gen Xers are leaving corporate and they want to pursue entrepreneurship. It's increased the buyer pool three to four times um, from it from where it typically. So most industries are actually trading at higher multiples than they traditionally do. So from a buying perspective, it's, it's not a buyer's market. It's definitely a seller's market. Um, and there are a few areas that I would say are being crazy overvalued at this point. Um, that being said, any of the businesses that were shut down by pandemic restrictions, um, you're still able to pick up uh, for a relatively good good price. So that could be um, restaurants, salons, fitness, a lot of the, the brick and mortar retail front facing, they face this, the hardest restrictions. The, the downside on those acquisitions right now is you cannot get financing because the financials are so crazy for the last two years. So a lot of those deals are having to be done with cash and carry. In terms of financing, what, what do the finance, what, what are like, what do people love right now in terms of financing? Um, anything that wasn't affected by the pandemic, right? Now, um, you know, so um, construction trades have been really good. Um, anything with recurring revenue. So that could be software as a service, or it could be, you know, we've seen um, companies that provide 
um, services on your heating and cooling systems, and they have recurring revenue because they have recurring service models. So any business that has recurring revenue, banks love um, and will own against all day. Um, they really like medical. They like professional practices to um, law firms, accounting firms, things like that. Some of them you can even get uh, like 10% down. Um, I think even right now, there's a couple of banks that are financing dental practices for 100% financing. You don't have to put any money down. So yeah, there's still a lot of money available in the marketplace, which is also driving the buyer's market, right? Yeah. Oh, Great question. Sure. So, yeah, you're welcome. Hello, oh, Priscilla. In addition to what uh, Sandeep just said about recurring revenue, in a situation whereby you have the, the margin on the recurring revenue is so tiny, but due to mass volume of uh, recurring revenue, Revenue does it really matter? Will it attract investors in that case as well? Um, in in terms of investors, I I don't deal in with investment, so I, I can't really comment on that. Um, I will say that from a buyer's perspective, any type of recurring revenue, no matter what the volume is, is highly desirable in an acquisition right now. Okay, good. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Good. You're, you're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, well, I think that's good. I appreciate all of your time. Um, I'll hand it back over to, um, I think Aditya, right? You're gonna wrap us up? Yep, thanks, Jessica, thanks so much. So, you know, uh, Jessica, just to sum it up, I think uh, personally, the talk really resonated with me because uh, I have implemented a lot of these things in my own businesses since many years. So I'm out of all operational roles, you know, viewing the businesses and monitoring numbers, bottom line valuations. I do agree with you that it's important to be prepared to sell, you know, even if it's your plan B, it's the important but not urgent bits of things that you need to do. I have a different take as well. I think all of us need to worry about business valuation, maximizing valuation, and uh, because, you know, this is really what is contributing to our net worth. So, so even if we don't have plans to sell, it's important to know, you know, if the value is growing. Uh, the takeaways we had was how to prioritize and define the best exit options for our business, uh, presenting financials in the best light for exit, and uh, how to move from an operator to an owner model in your own business to maximize value. Uh, I also wanted to mention to everyone that Jessica has an exciting book launch on the 1st of April. Uh, I think the book is called Getting the Most for Selling Your Business. Uh, Jessica, do you want to talk about this? Or yeah, it's uh, launching on April 1st. Um, I just dropped a, a link in there too, exitfactor.com com um, backslash book. Um, you can get a reminder and you can even read the first chapter of the book if you'd like. Um, but it, it's about this talk, but expanded. So we talk about how can you really increase the value of your business? And then the whole second half of the book is dedicated to actual plans. So if you have six months to sell, what can you do? If you have 12 months to sell, what can you do? And if you have 24 or more months to sell, what can you do? So very tactical approach. Great, Jessica. Thanks. I think we're looking forward to the launch and reading that book soon. And uh, yeah, we're done. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks, Alex. Uh, over to you.